you're tuned into the first newscast devoted to the Highland Lakes area. Local team coverage on Tribune Headline News, bringing you the stories you care about now. Hi everyone, I'm Connie Swinney. This is the Picayune TV. You're watching us on Northland Channel 15. Here's a peek at the stories we have in our broadcast today. In Horseshoe Bay, it was a meeting of the minds for lawmen around the region. Their aim to get suspects to fess up and make the confession stick in court. We have details. Also, a horse is more than just a horse in this exhibition. Over a hundred participants from around the country, including some from the Marble Falls area, strut their stuff for prizes, a television camera, and a good cause. Go do your rain dances. We've got a chance for rain and thunderstorms the next couple of days. We'll tell you more later in weather. Thanks, Jared. See you in a moment. And we have the latest on a case where a man faces manslaughter charges in a Highway 71 collision. This is Tribune Headline News. Stay with us. We are established. We are qualified. We are certified. We are knowledgeable. We are dependable. We are Ken's Heating and Air. Our people make the difference. Welcome back. Making the crooks sing without ruffling any legal feathers. A who's who of law enforcement attends a local conference on interviews and interrogation techniques. Thomas Edwards has more. There's a fine line between justice and getting a case tossed out on a technicality. That's why Horseshoe Bay Police Tuesday hosted a day-long conference on proper techniques of interviewing and interrogating suspects. The training is invaluable to keep police abreast of legal developments. Held at the Horseshoe Bay Resort Marriott Hotel, about 50 police, sheriffs, and state law enforcement officers attended the in-service training. The seminar was given by Burnett County's Sonny McAfee, a former Houston Police Department homicide investigator who is now a lawyer and a yes, consultant sorry, to law enforcement. What we're doing is covering the legal aspects of interrogation. How you can legally obtain a confession and how it's admissible in court. What the goal is is to make sure people know the rules for lawfully obtaining a confession and then the rules for being able to get into evidence against the person from whom they obtained the confession. But the topics that were covered today are applicable to any law enforcement officer and anyone who is involved in interviews of personnel in the law enforcement community. There are so many changes that take place in the courts and if we're not aware of those, then we might have a misstep somewhere along the way. So we always want to be involved in continuing education process to make sure we're up to speed on all of the uh, new laws, yes, uh, whether they're statutory laws or whether they're case laws that impact our profession. Reporting for the Picayune TV, I'm Thomas Edwards. In our next headline, the trial begins for a man charged with three counts of intoxication manslaughter in connection with the death of a victim and two of his four children on Highway 71. John Wesley Horn is accused of colliding with a second vehicle in the summer of 2009 while driving east of Marble Falls on Highway 71. The victim, Russell Kyle Rutland, and his four children were in the second vehicle. Two of the children survived. Horn also faces charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Testimony is continuing now in 33rd District Court in Burnett. We are covering the testimony in detail at dailytrib.com. We'll keep you posted on the outcome. The Marble Falls High School soccer programs announced their individual team award winners. We're going to tell you all about that coming up in sports. We've got a 40% chance of rain and thunderstorms today and a lingering chance tomorrow, but we'll see if that comes through. Here's your Highland Lakes forecast for Northland 15 and the Picayune TV. Wednesday, like I said, we've got a 40% chance of showers and thunderstorms, cloudy skies with a high near 85, winds between 10 and 15. Wednesday night, we've still got that 40% chance of showers and thunderstorms, mostly cloudy skies with a low around 72. Thursday, we still have a chance of showers and thunderstorms, 30% to be exact, mostly cloudy skies with a high near 87. Thursday night, that decreases to a 20% chance of showers and thunderstorms, mostly cloudy skies with a low around 67. 
Friday, we'll see the sun a little bit more, partly sunny skies, with a high near 86, north northwest wind between 5 and 10 miles an hour. For now, it doesn't look like we'll have a chance for rain during the weekend, but we'll keep you posted in our forecast as the week goes on. That's your Highland Lakes forecast for Northland 15 and the Picayune TV. I'm Jared Fields. Thanks, Jared. Jennifer Fierro joins us on location at Marble Falls Mustang Stadium with today's sports report. Welcome to Mustang Stadium, home of the Marble Falls High School soccer teams. Recently, head coaches Paulette Munchigamba and Michael Nave welcomed their players, families, and fans to the annual award ceremonies where they announced all of the MVPs for the season. We're going to start with the boys. Team defensive MVP was Joel Chavez, while Carter Robertson was the team offensive MVP. The midfielder of the year was Geronimo Aguilar. The team MVP was Jamie Hernandez, and of course, the Mustang Pride Award went to the entire senior class. We did get a chance to catch up with Carter and get his thoughts on being named the offensive MVP. It was just a great season, and it meant so much to our team that we're more like a family than anything else. It's not just a team. Not to leave out the girls, the rising star was Crystal Arion, while Danny Suarez was given the Heart and Hustle Award. The offensive MVP was Elise Cardenas. The defensive MVP went to Megan Russell, and the overall team MVP was Savannah Henderson. We also had a chance to talk to Savannah about being named the team MVP. Here's what she had to say. It was fun. I mean, it takes a whole team to make an MVP. It's just like leadership and stuff. That's it for sports. I'm Jennifer Fierro. Connie, back to you. Jennifer, thanks. Horse shows can be quite grueling for competitive riders, but we found an event which allowed a few horsemen to show off their skills with a chance at prizes, publicity, and a laid-back atmosphere. What you're watching is an event sponsored by the American Competitive Trail Horse Association. The national organization got its start four years ago with founders from Spicewood and Dripping Springs. For the first time ever, the group referred to as ACTHA is hosting an exhibition which coincides with a proposed TV show pilot called America's Favorite Trail Horse. It's scheduled to be aired on the National Horse Racing Channel, that's HRTV, in September. About 100 riders from around the country are participating in the four-day event just outside Johnson City. Competitors have a chance to win a combined $100,000 prize package. When the show airs, viewers will vote on their favorite in American Idol style. The local group hosts not only exhibitions like this, but also competitive trail challenges and trail rides. Their aim is to bring riders together and raise awareness and funding for horse rescue projects. I like the people, the personalities, and the stories, and I like to see the love between a horse and their rider. There's something about a horse that just grounds you. It brings you peace. I've heard these stories that have brought me to tears the last few weeks. Um, stories of horse that have been horses that have been rescued. This is called America's Favorite Trail Horse. Uh, we're showcasing uh, 100 top riders from around the country out of the thousands that auditioned. And these are the top 100, and they're competing for $100,000. And they're trying to bring attention to the fun involved in trail riding, all breeds and no breed, and uh, we're hoping this creates more interest in trail riding and rescues horses out of the horse rescues and keep them off the slaughter trucks. The event includes so-called garden obstacle coursework, a trail ride, free consultation with horse clinicians, food, and live entertainment. Those were your headlines. Thanks so much for watching us on Northland Channel 15. For the Picayune TV, I'm Connie Swinney. Hi and welcome to Tribune Talk with Thomas Edwards, Special Candidates Edition. Today we're in beautiful downtown Burnett at the Hill Country Community Foundation Building. We're going to be taking a look at the Burnett City Council races, putting the hard questions to the candidates. Stay tuned. Hi and welcome to Tribune Talk with Thomas Edwards, Special Candidates Edition. Today we're taking a look at the Burnett <coughs> City Council race. The field is a very crowded one. Although the mayor's race is unopposed, there are up to nine candidates running for City Council. Today 
we're lucky to have two of those candidates be here with us on the show, Michelle Devaney and Carl Peel. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice Thank to be you. here. We're going to toss a couple questions to them and see how they do. And then, of course, there'll be what we like to call the wild card question. Ms. Devaney, the first question is for you. What are the infrastructure weaknesses in Burnett and what can be done about those? Well, that's a good question. The biggest weaknesses in the uh, city's infrastructure is the sewer treatment plant. Our current plant is old and running at full capacity with no room for growth. Plus, TCEQ requires that we fix it. The question was to update or replace it, and it was found to be more economical to replace it. If elected to city council, then I will use my business accounting experience to make sure this much needed improvement will not become a burden financially to the citizens of Burnett. Also, Burnett's population has grown by more than 20% in the last 10 years and is expected to continue to grow. An increase in population goes hand in hand with a needed increase in public safety services that include more employees, equipment, and a larger facility. There are necessary in order to maintain and promote a superior quality of life in the city of Burnett to all citizens and our future citizens. Thank you very much, Mr. Vane, for that answer. And now, Mr. Peel, I toss a question to you, sir. Thank you. It's always tough to go second. Uh, of course, I'd rather talk about those infrastructure things that really make Burnett a great place to live, but we're going to talk about the negatives. And she's exactly right. The waste treatment plant is number one. It's a $22 million expense. So we've got to find some creative ways to finance that to minimize the impact on our citizens. I'm also going to talk about the Galloway Hammond Recreation Center because it's city owned. It's also part of our infrastructure, but it's also a part of our infrastructure that requires a half a million dollars a year to keep the doors open. So we have to find new ways to fund that so that we can spend that half a million dollars some other way. So there's two right there that we need a lot of work on. Good. Well, thank you very much for that response. And now we'll move on to our second question. What is the best way to bring more industry and business to burn it? And Mr. Vaney, again, we'll give you the first crack at that question. All right, thank you very much. Um, I believe that new businesses can be attracted with incentives such as grants, loans, the donation of in-kind city services, job tax credits per job created, and sales tax rebates. Attracting these new businesses will benefit the city by stimulating our local economy, which includes an increase in the city's tax base and the creation of additional jobs. A great example of some of these incentives working is ATMI and Stealth Industries. Our new sewer plant, other improvement projects and systems are needed to help prepare Burnett to handle these additional businesses. Then the city should actually help expedite the process that they must undergo to open a new business in Burnett. When companies look around for a place to locate, they look to see what Burnett has to offer in comparison with what other cities have. Burnett has to have a good incentive plan. As a current business owner operator in the city, I feel I have the experience to be a great asset to the community in this area. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Vaney. And again, Mr. Peel, the question to you, what can be done to bring more business and industry to burn it? This one I could spend 30 minutes to an hour on, but I only have a minute here. So basically, the, my main purpose will be to redirect the Economic Development Corporation of Burnett which in the last five years has spent over two and a half million dollars on projects that really have not had any impact on the economic development. Uh, $600,000 to the remanufacture of the square. Uh, in 2009, they committed a half a million dollars for, to increase the turn lane, put a turn lane between Delaware Springs and Park Road 4, which there's not a retail business in that whole stretch of road. Uh, they also committed a half a million dollars to the new Hayes Nelson Park which the park was already funded, but they decided that they needed to curb and pave all the roads down there to the cost of $322,000. And they also committed another $150,000 to an amphitheater. Hmm. And most recently, the city council and EDC did a little fun game and had the EDC buy a piece of property that the city already owned to build a fire department on. I don't understand that transaction. Hmm. So I want to refocus EDC economic development to doing economic development projects. I see. Thank you very much for that response. And now we get to what we like to call the wild card question. This is a question that the candidates have not been prepped for, 
It is completely off the cuff. That's what their answer would be. <coughs> it is, has arisen from viewer participation, reader participation, and even bull sessions among us journalists. And so here we go. Let's see how our candidates do with the wild card question. This time we're going to start with Mr. Peel. Mr. Peel, do you see future growth at the Burnett Municipal Airport and should it be expanded? I consider the airport one of our crown jewels in our crown at Burnett. It's critical to our long-term growth. And I believe it's a major asset that we, that we have and we do have to continue to expand it so that we continue to get traffic into that airport. But it's a major asset, yes. And Mr. Vaney, I'll toss the same question to you. Do you see future growth at the Burnett Municipal Airport and should it be expanded? Uh, yes, I do. Um, the Burnett Airport is a great asset and with a bigger expansion, longer runway, we can bring in more industry, maybe some commuter flights, have more businesses come in. Um, a lot of your big industries do have you know, corporate um, or higher CEOs that may not live here per se, but they do have businesses elsewhere and they will be coming in and out. So I think a bigger airport improvement will be good. Good. Thank you for your response. Thank you viewers for watching. This has been Tribune Talk with Thomas Edwards, Candidates Edition. Today we've taken a look at the Burnett City Council race. It's a very crowded race. I want to thank our two guests, candidates Michelle Devaney and Carl Peel. Very nice of them to be here. We hope you'll go out and vote on May 14th. Exercise your right. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.